This conference will now be recorded. This week during week five, we're going to look at two different items. We're going to look at itemized deductions. and We're also going to look at something that is outside of this textbook, but I think it's something that you should at least be familiar with, and it's called the fair, fair tax or the flat tax. I wanted to introduce it to you just so you have an idea of what it is if somebody ever talks about it. With this itemized deductions, these are going to become less and less common, I believe, as we go forward throughout the next five plus years. And the reason is the standard deduction has risen as much as it has. It's almost doubled since 2017 for the year 2018. As you can see down here, it's expected that less than probably 10 percent of taxpayers will actually itemize because of that standard deduction being raised so high. So with uh, this is our first primary schedule that we're going to look at beyond the, the new schedules for the 1040, the schedules one through five that we have previously uh, talked on a little bit on some of them, especially schedule one. These are the more common schedules that anybody who's dealt with taxes would be familiar with just in that they have been around for a number of years. And we're gonna talk about this first one today, the itemized deductions. You only itemize if the amount of deductions in that category are more than your standard deduction. Remember the standard deduction for somebody in the single bracket, single uh, filing status is 12,000, so that's pretty high. And for married filing joint, it's all the way up to 24,000. We're going to look at the rest of these schedules. Um, well, we've kind of already looked at Schedule B. That was last week, and I said how that was a very simple schedule. All it is is a listing of where you receive your interest and or dividends from the companies, and you only need to fill it out if the amount from either one of those categories is more than $1,500. The final three down here, there are more schedules in this, but these are the most common. These, the final three that I have listed, we're going to look at in the second half of the semester with owning your own business, and then capital gain and losses. This is generally with stocks, selling, buying and selling stocks. You're going to have capital gain and losses. And then uh, we're going to finish. We're going to also look at rental income as it has its own schedule for people who rent out homes. <clears throat> Okay, so the standard deduction is the way that the government allows you to not have to keep nitpicky receipts. Perhaps, and it's just a deduction on your income, knowing that you have to have some income that you that you basically live on, and it would be unfair to tax every single dollar. So they say, okay, the, if you're married, the first twenty-four thousand, we're not going to tax at all. So you get that dollar for dollar uh, without taxation. And I've reminded us down here what the standard deductions are. That's the second number compared to what they were in, a, in the prior tax seasons before 2018. So it's almost doubled in every category. That's why it was much easier, especially for somebody in the single category, to itemize if they only had to gather up 6,300 6350 in expenses in the itemized category compared to now 12,000 where most people may have maybe they got up to 8,000 so it was still beneficial to itemize because that's more than the standard now the 8,000 is going to help them the 12,000 is going to be a much better deal here are the primary items that you can still itemize there are some item itemized items that have been taken away and one in particular, this one down here, the casualty and theft losses, that is uh, very limited now. It used to be for anybody, now it's only for those in federal disaster areas. And then you'll see that there's one other big limitation and it's gonna be on this one, the state and local taxes. You can only take up to 10,000 in state and local taxes as a deduction and that includes your real estate tax and that won't necessarily affect a lot of people in and around the Midwest, perhaps the normal middle class. Who it will affect a lot is more people on the coast where they have higher standards of living, higher cost of living, I should say, with higher 
real estate taxes and property taxes. So we're going to touch on every one of these. It's, it won't take us too long. But the first, uh, one of the biggest ones here is medical expenses. Medical expenses can be a whole wide range of items. However, to be able to deduct medical expenses, you have to hit a threshold of at least seven and a half percent of your AGI. If you don't hit that, you don't need to take any medical expenses as an itemized deduction. And I'll explain that here as we go through. But I wanted to throw that out there right away that medical expenses sound good, but you have to have a bunch of them before it starts to count as an itemized deduction. All right, notice here who you're allowed to pay medical expenses for, you and yourself, and of course your dependents. And then you're also allowed, even if somebody isn't your dependent, you can still take a medical expense deduction for them if you paid it. And if they would have been your dependent, but these two exceptions, you can claim it if they would have been your dependent, except for the gross income test. So remember that gross income test threshold is very, very low, just over 4,000. If they only make $6,000 a year in taxable income, that's not enough to support themselves if that was their only income. But still, the tax law says you can't take them as a dependent. However, for medical expense reasons, if you pay medical expenses for that individual, and they would have been your dependent, except that they made the $6,000 in my example, then you can claim those medical expenses as your own because you didn't pay it, and they would have been your dependent. The only other exception here is for the divorce. <clears throat> you can include the expenses if you paid it, even if you do not claim custody of the child. If it is your child and you still pay it, you can claim it. Notice a few of the items that you cannot take. You can't take the premiums that are taken out of your check. That would be considered double dipping. And, that, and the reason is when you look at your, if you earn 40000 in a year, but you have 3,000 taken out for medical premiums. The only thing that shows up on your W-2, it isn't 40, it's really 37,000 that shows up as box one that's taxable. So therefore, if you take out another 3,000 as an itemized deduction, that you're double dipping. Not only are you taking it, not including it on the W-2, you're then taking it away from the W-2 items that you do have and deducting it again. So therefore, that's why you're not allowed to deduct medical premiums taken out of your paycheck. Same thing with the FSA or HSA. These are not even included in your W-2 amount. So therefore, they're not taxed at all. So if you deduct again the amount that you spent on FSA items or HSA, you would be double dipping. and That's not allowed. And then we're, so we're going to look below here some of the items that you are allowed and are not allowed to take. Now, getting back to the threshold, you can put all of the expenses that you are allowed to claim there on line one, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to take them all. So just because maybe you put $5,000 here, as, we, as we'll see in my example, on line one, you're only going to be able to take a small portion of that $5,000 because you have to exceed at least 7.5% your EGI before even the first dollar of itemized deductions of medical expenses are allowed as an itemized deduction. Notice here, as of now, with the tax rule, that 7.5% is going to go up to 10% for tax year 2019. So if you're watching this in a future year, you may be using the 10% instead of what I'm doing right now as the 7.5%. It's a small change, and you can easily work through that when we go through the examples and then look at my notes for your updated answers compared to what the video has. So let's see what we'd actually be allowed to take in this example. If I had medical expenses of 5,000 and a relatively modest AGI of only 40, that's pretty low compared to the amount of medical expenses. How much of my medical expenses would I be able to take as an itemized deduction? And we're gonna see that when you actually work it out, it's, it's very small. Especially it with the higher standard deductions, the amount that you're going to get to take isn't going to help you that much. So 
of 40,000. You do the math, I would go ahead and pause, do the math, and then compare that to the 5,000, and then subtract out whatever the 7.5% is, and whatever's left out of the five, that's what you can take. Okay, so for this first one, when we take 7.5% of 40,000, that's telling us that the first 3,000 is not allowed. We have to just not use that out of the 5,000 that I paid. So I would only be allowed to uh, put on my tax return as an, as an official itemized deduction $2,000 for that line four schedule A. Now I can put the full five up there in line one, but I can't use it all. So then what happens or what is allowed as a qualifying medical expense? Any prescriptions that you pay, and now this is paying out of pocket, this is not out of your FSA or your HSA account, your flexible spending, and that, that accounts for all of these. Any premiums that you have to pay for, that's through a private insurance, not through your work. Costs you pay for out of your normal checking account, perhaps, or on a credit card, not through your FSA. This is a big one that can really help if, you, if it needs to happen is any special equipment. Special equipment you can, you can take as long as it is a medical necessity. Cosmetic surgery is kind of an iffy one. Only You're only allowed it if it's to correct a, something you were born with or something that had an injury to get you back to where you were, that, that is fine. You can deduct those type of expenses, but normal like a facelift type of cosmetic surgeries are not allowed. Nursing home expenses, yes, as long as the, you're in, the individual that you pay for in the nursing home is there for medical care and not simply as an old age retirement type home, which I think would be kind of, is not very common anyway. Um, the last item here, the long-term long care premiums, this all depends on your age. You need to refer back to the textbook on page 5-7 or simply Google it if you don't have the, the text there in front of you. And you can see what the premium uh, caps are because there are caps depending on your age limit. Items that you're not allowed to take, as you can see here, mainly the big one here is over-the-counter drugs and then any improvement of health programs you're not allowed to take. A couple of the last items for medical care, and these are a little bit more abnormal, especially these capital expenditures. So if you have to put in an elevator into your home because of a disability, you can deduct it perhaps, and we'll go through that. Same thing with it, you have to buy a handicap van. You have to meet these type of requirements so prescribed, it is a necessity. It's not an, a lavish type item. And the only amount you are allowed to deduct is if the expense exceeds the increase in value of the property. So if you had to change your van to a handicapped van, however much that cost, let's say it costs $6,000, but it only raised the, the V value of your van by 4,000. That extra 2,000 difference would be what you're allowed to deduct. Same thing down here in my little example. You put in an elevator in the house. I have no idea what they cost, so I just made a, a very limited guess here of 5,000. It increases the value of your home by 3,000. So that extra 2,000 that you're technically not getting a benefit for, that you won't ever realize is considered a medical expense and you can use that on your schedule a the last thing here is the transportation you are allowed to deduct going back and forth to hospital for doctor visits or hospital care and you're even allowed to deduct lodging it's probably easiest to do the standard mileage rate which is though it is very low it's only 18 cents a mile so you'll have to decide is it better to use the actual cost of the gas or the 18 cents per mile and that is for the year 2018. Notice the standard rate does not include tolls and parking. You can add those on in addition to your standard rate or the actual costs. 
and then lodging you're allowed to deduct up to fifty dollars per person per day and that's up to two people the patient and somebody traveling with the patient so a, a max of a hundred dollars a day you can deduct for lodging as a medical expense meals are not allowed for uh, medical reasons you're going to have to eat anyway so they don't allow you to deduct any meals okay that's the first section now moving down to taxes you can deduct certain taxes uh, as an itemized deduction that you pay and these are almost all going to be state and local taxes so then the first thing is what's the difference between a tax and a fee because there is a difference Taxes are out there and raise just general money, while a fee is more of a specific benefit for you, perhaps. Like a fishing license would be a fee. Uh, anything that's a set value is usually a fee if it's not based on the value of the property. If it's just a straight $10 fee, that is considered a fee and not a tax. All right, so as you can see here, beginning in 2018, you're, the most you can put down as state and local income taxes is a limit of 10,000. And this could be big for those with high priced homes. It won't make much difference in around the Midwest unless you live in a real affluent area. So you're allowed to deduct. That's why it's important that we begin to get in the habit of putting in the Taxes taken out on the W-2 down at the bottom. Those are the state and local taxes, because in Indiana, we do have local taxes, county taxes, and those count. And if we would have enough, we would be able to de itemize our deductions with these um, payroll with, uh, withholdings. These are, these are income tax withholdings. Now, if your state doesn't have an income tax, and there are nine of them, then the IRS allows those individuals to do one of two things. They can keep track of all of their sales taxes throughout the entire year, which would be a huge hassle. Or they can simply use this publication 600. And depending on how much money they make and their family size, you can determine how much about in sales taxes that you paid. The, the good thing is then that's just normal sales taxes. If you would have bought something big, like a car or a boat, you can then add that on to your normal, whatever this number would have came out to be from these charts. You can add that extra sales tax on on that big purchase. Notice you can't claim both the sales and the income tax. So therefore you wanna pick the one that's better suited. Most of the time it's gonna be the income tax. If you do have, if you're in a state that has income tax like Indiana, only time it may not be is if you make some big purchases and then you may want to switch to and use the sales tax that year and include whatever you bought with those big purchases, the additional sales tax. So therefore you can't take your state income tax in Indiana and then add in the boat that you bought, the sales tax. You can't do a combination. Now there is a difference. If you take out, if you have too much money taken out of your uh, w-2 you may get a refund state tax refunds this is you getting money back these here is you paying money if you get money back we talked about this in the in the prior week this is actually taxable income but only if you itemized last year and you deducted the state taxes typically if you itemized in the past year and you got a refund in your state income tax from the government, just like you normally would on your 1040 if you got one back on the Indiana return and you itemized on your 1040, then you'll have to include the state tax refund. Otherwise, you do not. If you did standard deduction in that previous year and you got a state income tax refund, you do not have to record it. Okay, real estate taxes. Real estate taxes, you can deduct. Now notice there could be a slight difference between what actually goes in out of your, you know, your monthly mortgage payment. Some of it's gonna go into an escrow account, but what you actually end up paying or what the escrow account actually pays 
to your local government, that's what you're allowed to deduct. Give you that little example here. Property during the year is prorated at the closing. So you always want to look at that closing statement, or you can simply know that even though one person may have paid the entire $1,500 in real estate tax, that person doesn't get to claim all of it in the year of the sale because part of it would have came off on the closing price. And so the seller would be allowed a portion, whatever part of the year they own the house, they can claim that much. Property taxes, this is our final area in the state and local taxes. You are allowed to deduct these, and these are taxes that these are taxes that you are um, paying on the value of your property. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I had to take a quick little pause there. Property taxes, uh, they, they have to be based on the value of the property. So when you look at your registration for your car, in Indiana, there's usually two different fees, or there's a fee and a tax you have to pay. You're not allowed to deduct that the fee. The fee is, at least it is, or it is as of right now, called a wheel tax. That's a straight fee that everybody has to pay. And I think right now it's around $25. It's not based on the value of your property. It's just if you get a registration for a car, you have to pay it. The other piece is based on the value and the type of your car. And that is what is deductible. Whatever tax you have to pay that if you have a newer car and it's a more expensive car, you're going to pay a higher tax than somebody with an 18 year old car. All right, the third category is interest. Typically, by default, interest is not allowed as a deduction. However, there are two, uh, two one that's big primary exception and one that's a kind of a small primary uh, an exception. The biggest exception is on your the value of your home. So note you're not allowed to deduct interest on credit card, car loans. However, though we'll go we'll get back to this, but remember with student loans, you are allowed to deduction on student loans. It's the best deduction there is because you don't have to itemize. Remember with student loans, um, you can deduct that right on the 1040 on, on your uh, Schedule 1. So that's the best option for interest. These are the next best. If you, if you do itemize, you can take a deduction on the amount of interest you pay. Uh, it's got to be on your primary mortgage or your mortgage on your second home. You can only have it on, you can only take interest on one of the two. Take it right on uh, line 10 on Schedule A. So you can see the qualified residence. It's either your main home or, or your one other home. It does count RVs as long as it would be considered a, you could live out of it, meaning it has a toilet, sleeping area, and cooking area. As long as it has the primary needs, necessities to live, you are allowed to count that. You're only allowed the mortgage on the first 750,000 of debt, again, around Midwest, that's not gonna be much of an issue for most people. However, along the coasts and in high value areas that does, that would come into play quite quickly. So if you, if you, so then you think, well, what happens if I do have a mortgage of a million dollars? Am I not allowed to take anything? You are, you are allowed to, but if your mortgage is a million, then you have to do the simple fraction and say I'm allowed 750 and I have a million so that's three-fourths so then whatever three-fourths of the amount of interest that I paid that's how much I can deduct not all of it but at least a portion okay now the home equity loan home equity loan is if you have a second mortgage you are allowed to deduct that only if that second mortgage loan went and goes to upping your house, um, upping the value of your house, increasing it, maybe putting on it a separate extension of the house. Pause one more time. 
This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so uh, with our home home equity loan, you can only take on the up to the first hundred thousand. Then that's even uh, there's even a qualifier there. You can take the lesser of a hundred thousand or the fair market value of your home less the first mortgage. So what that's so I give us an example here to help clear that up. So you you have a outstanding mortgage of eighty thousand, and the value of your home is only is one hundred twenty. You can't you can't deduct you can't you can take it out, but you can't deduct the interest up to a hundred thousand. You can only do it up to forty because it's the fair market value of the home less what you still have at standing in that first mortgage. So 120 fair market less the 80. So you can you can take out more than that if the bank lets you, but you wouldn't be allowed to deduct it for the tax purposes. OK, read through example B and determine how much of an interest deduction would you be allowed in this example? Go ahead and pause. OK, so we've got two homes here. Remember, we can take the uh, qualified interest on our original purchases for up to two residents. And so we've got our two, our primary mortgage and then our vacation home. The only issue is these two added together is a million. We're only allowed up to the first 750,000 in debt for mortgage. So as I had previously done with, we take 750 divided by a million, that's three fourths. We would be allowed to take three fourths of the 35,000. And that would be the amount we could put on our on our tax return as. Let's see what it is here. Three fourths is 26,250 as an itemized deduction. Points points are what you pay on a mortgage to get the interest rate as low as possible. Any amount that you pay on your initial mortgage right up front, you can deduct that uh, right away as, as an itemized deduction. If, however, you pay points later on to refinance, you cannot take it right away. You have to take it over a little bit at a time, which can be very just uh, time consuming, more paperwork. If you paid three thousand dollars to lower your mortgage uh, interest rate, and this, you were five years into your mortgage, you're doing it as a refinance. You have well, you would have to deduct that three thousand over the remaining life of the loan that you now have. So two hundred twenty-five a year doesn't really help you out like three thousand would, but you can't do it any you can't do it any other way. What's called PMI? That's for individuals who don't put down at least twenty percent on their original mortgage if you don't put down at least 20 as a cash deposit you will have to start pay, you will have to pay into pmi that used to be deductible the amount that you paid in it is no longer as of 2018. the final piece the investment interest you can deduct interest if you take out a loan to buy investments now the caveat here is these investments have to be income producing so if you take money out to buy stocks or bonds, regular bonds, and you have taxable income, then you can take the deduction up to the amount of taxable income. But if you took this money to buy municipal bonds, whenever you get money back on the municipal bonds, it's not deductible or it's not taxable. It's non-taxable interest. So if it's not taxable, you can't deduct anything over here either as any interest that you paid. So the one caveat out there, you are allowed to deduct interest on investment um, loans, but only as if those investments create taxable income. Okay, our one of our last ones, charity contributions. We're going to have this, and then we'll have a couple other smaller ones that aren't nearly as common. But this is our last big common item. If you contribute to a uh, actual charitable organization, you are allowed the deduction. Notice it cannot be just to, you cannot count if you give it to a person at the church and you decide that person's in, in need, that doesn't count. The money has to go through the church. Then if the church decides to give it to that person, that's great. 
if not, well, that's not your call. The uh, the amount you have to always give your your charity deducted to count it as a deduction. You have to provide it to a qualified organization. Notice here you are allowed a huge amount to deduct to a charity organization. So this is mainly if you come into a large item through uh, a gift that you may have received or through an inheritance and then you want to donate it and it's a large dollar amount, you are allowed to deduct a large amount off of your taxes, 60% of your AGI you can use in one of the years, in any year, but perhaps that one year that you had that large item come in, you can deduct 60% of your AGI. So if you had a 40,000 AGI, you could deduct up to 24,000 just in charity, which is very big. Notice you are, um, if you can't use the entire amount because of that AGI limit, let's say your item that you donated was 40,000 total, so right at your AGI, you could deduct 24 now and carry forward the rest of that unused 16,000 for the next five years and use it whenever you have the opportunity. If you do non-cash charity and it's over $500 to any one place, then you have to fill out the special form that designates exactly what the items were and how you arrived at the value. If it's over 5,000, it has to have a professional appraisal just to make sure you're not chipping the government. Because up here, when you do this non-cash, when you go to uh, Goodwill, a lot of times they won't value the property. You have to do your own valuation and you don't want to have a bag of clothes and then say it was worth thousand dollars that's probably not going to be a realistic thrift value at a goodwill store notice here when when do you need cash receipts what when, when will cancel check be okay you are allowed to deduct mileage if you if you drive people somewhere whatever it is or you transport items for charity you can deduct up to 14 cents a mile the big thing that you cannot deduct that I, I'll have in here in just a second is amounts of service. If you're a lawyer and you donate an hour or two a week at the local library to give free legal advice, that doesn't count, unfortunately. You are not allowed to deduct the value of your time. If your property is a long-term capital gain property that you have donated, and what all that simply means is if you would have sold it you would have had to record a gain on the property. So maybe you got it and it was worth 5,000, but you can sell it for eight. That would be a long-term capital gain property because you're selling it for more than you got it for and assuming you had it for at least a year. If that's the case, the AGI, you're, you're limited to your uh, charity deduction of only 30% compared to the 60. If you are limited because of that AGI, you can carry forward like on the other one up to five years. The item as well in this type of case to be able to use this long term capital gain property where you don't where you are allowed to deduct more than what you paid for it, you're allowed to deduct the actual value. It has to go. Your item has to go to a related purpose meaning you can't give, as I put here, a painting. If you have a nice valued painting, you give it to a museum and they have it on display, that's fine, that's great. That's what paintings are for. If you give it to somewhere and it just goes into somebody's office at a charity type place, that isn't what the painting is necessarily for. It doesn't get the use that it normally would. So you wouldn't be able, that would be a non-related use property and you would only be allowed to deduct 5,000 out of the eight that it went up to in, in, in value, just a made up example. So long-term capital gain property, you're allowed to deduct the full value, maybe that 8,000, as long as it's not over 30% of your AGI. But if it's an unrelated property to use, then you can only use your basis which is what you had got it for, maybe 5,000. All right, look at these next three examples, C, C2, and C3. 
and then you'll want to pause after each one and we'll talk through how much you would be allowed to deduct. Okay, with C, it cost, we're do donating this uh, capital gain property. It costs five, but now it's worth 50, so it's definitely went up in value. And our AGI may or may not come into play. We'll see, because remember with long-term capital gain property, it can only be up to 30% uh, of your AGI for this year. So 30% of 80,000 is 24,000. So the most I can deduct in year one is 24,000. And that would be my answer. The rest of it would be carried forward for the next five. So I would be able to deduct 24 now, 26 being carried forward. Okay, pause for example two. With this one, this one would not be a capital gain long-term long -term capital gain property because the value of the item actually went down. If that's the case, then we are back to just our regular 60% rules and we would be allowed to deduct the full uh, fair market value of whatever it's worth. Remember, we can't deduct the full price. It'd be just like deducting a pair of jeans and at Goodwill. If you bought a nice $100 pair of jeans, you can only deduct what they're worth when you donate it. And in this case, the same. So we would have to take the lower value, but we're not at that 30% rule either. We're all the way up to 60% and we don't hit the 60% uh, mark. Our final example, this one is for an unrelated use. When it's an unrelated use, we're only allowed to deduct the original cost, so 2000 when it's in an unrelated use. Here's the final items for the non-deductible charities, things that you can't do, the biggest one being service of time. I'm not going to go through the theft and casualty losses. I'm going to have you go through this just because it's not very common anymore. But you will want to take, there are a few questions in the homework that you'll want to be familiar with. Some of the key, key items, but um, well, you can read through these. Key things though to remember here, and these are pretty much going to go away because you're never going to have a federal disaster area because of termites for one house. <clears throat> the miscellaneous itemized deductions is the last thing. The tax law has now gotten rid of the 2% itemized deductions that are subject to 2%. There are just a few things left that are considered miscellaneous. And the one we're going to look at in class is gambling losses, which are only allowed to deduct these up to gambling winnings. Think of this as like the investment interest that we had earlier. So if you have gambling losses that exceed your gambling winnings, you can only take your gambling losses up to those. So with my little example here, we had winnings of a total of $3,500 in our two different uh, gambling winnings total. We lost it all and an additional 1,500 for that whatever time frame. So how are these reported? That 3,500, we still report this as a miscellaneous income. We still have to put that on the 1040. And then we put this 3,500 not the original, not the rest of it, only the first 3,500 that we show as an income. We put that as an itemized deduction on our Schedule A. Okay, in this answer document here, I have the answers posted below for these uh, other four questions. I would take the time and practice them and see how you do and then check your answers with these answers. Now, with that, I am going to transition briefly over, and we're not going to be about five minutes, five, ten minutes at the most. And I wanted to look at the flat tax or the fair tax. So this has been floating around longer than at least 215, but that's when it's started to gain some steam. What this is, and a lot of people don't necessarily think it's 
good until they hear more about it. Then they think, oh, well, maybe it's not that bad. It's very similar to your state sales tax, meaning you don't pay any payroll taxes, no Social Security, no Medicare, no federal, no, or you would perhaps pay state, but no federal taxes. <clears throat> Everything would be paid for through a sales tax. The sales tax rate, and this is this is just a uh, thrown out number. It would be probably around this, but not exactly. Would be maybe a 30%. And that doesn't include the state sales tax. So then you have to pay an additional uh, in Indiana at 7%. And notice this would be on all new goods and services. That's key. Services right now in any I can't any state, especially in Indiana, you're not taxed on services. If you go to the accountant and you have a $100 bill, you just pay $100. You don't pay $100 plus a 7% sales tax. With this flat tax, you would pay tax on any new goods, brand new, not used, and services. So I tell you here, the 30% sales tax, if you ever hear that it's, that would be akin to a 23% payroll tax, yeah, that's confusing. And that's simply because you're gonna have more money up front to pay this higher rate and it would be similar to paying it after having the payroll tax of 23 percent let me explain that a little bit better with my example so a jacket costs 77 dollars and i tell i tell you that a payroll tax deduction of 23 percent or a state or a federal income tax of 30 percent would be the same let's see how that works this check, it costs 77, but if we have our normal income tax of 23%, so that means we earned 100, take out 23%, so $23, we're down to 77. We have $77 left to pay for that shirt, assuming no state, no state taxes, only federal right now. You're gonna have the exact same amount of money in the other option. If you get paid $100 with no income tax, you get $100 just in, instead of just the 77 because of the state. If you take 30% of 100 or no, 30% of the cost of that shirt, you're going to get $23, which is the exact same amount that tax that you had to pay over here. And this would work for any dollar amounts. So throw in other dollar amounts and it should work. Basically what this is saying is the 23% is on a higher dollar amount because that's what you earned. Whereas the 30% is on a lower dollar amount because that's gonna be uh, on just the price of the item, not the full amount that you made, but it still comes out to be the same, 23 and 30. It's weird and it takes a little time to think through it. Uh, how this, would be fair to the wealthy and the poor at the same time is the proposal is to put out a probate and this would offset sales taxes especially for those in the poor in the poor range middle to poor range and you can go through this document and see uh, what the probates would be what that is you would get a monthly check back from the government to help reimburse for all the sales taxes that you paid then Anybody would get this, rich and poor, but it would be assumed that the rich would pay more and better in sales tax because they would buy more stuff. So what the fair tax would do, it removes all of these type of taxes that you normally would see or pay. The biggest ones for individuals being the federal withholding and the FICA. So now the, the big test, let's see if it adds up, let's see if it works in a real life situation. So I give us this example, a family four, with two kids at home, income of 50,000. And I put a high number out here. It doesn't, this number is, is pretty high. Somebody in this, in this household may use a lot less um, new goods and services. May, they, they pay a lot of bills down, so they're not actually having goods and services in that case or they're paying on their electric bill or whatever it is. But I put it at a somewhat high number, 35,000. 
does it work out to be that they would get back about the same or even pay less with this type of tax? So what I did is I inputted this into our current tax system, and this is for the year 2017, so this isn't updated. But the amount of taxes that they would have had to pay, actually it was way back here into 2014, but it's still pretty close. Federal income tax that they would have had to pay is $366 total. And that includes all the deductions that they would have normally got on tax credit. So when you add in the Social Security that they would have had taken out of their check and the Medicare, this is how much taxes they would have paid. So I actually did this on a tax return. I calculated it all out to see what the total tax due plus Social Security plus Medicare. Out of the 50000 that family brings home $45,000, paying a tax of about an average tax of 8.4%. How does that compare with the flat tax? So they're going to pay 35,000 at the register and pay 30% tax on that because remember that's how much they spent on new and services, new goods and services. So that comes out to be 10,500 in taxes. It's about 200 in total tax compared to 4,100 in total tax up here in this system. So for this type of family in this situation, and it all depends on how much taxes they're on, how much new goods and services. If this number goes down, they pay less tax. If it goes up, they pay more tax. But at that rate, they actually get pay less tax than they would in the current system. Now the only other one is I did the exact same thing, but for a very low income individual who gets a lot of earned income credit and it doesn't work out nearly as well for this type of person. Single mom, two kids at home, taxable income is only 14,000. Now that's taxable. So that's after her standard deductions and things like that. She's got child support coming in as extra money and it's estimated she spends 22,000 of her 24,000, at least of taxable income. She spends 22,000 on new goods and services. So that could be a bit high, definitely high, but I put it on the high side just to see how it works. So if she does current tax um, with our current tax system, payroll tax, and with earned income credit, child tax credit, all that kind of stuff, she's actually going to get a refund and not pay a dollar. She's going to get back $7,100 $7, about. So therefore, income tax she gets back quite a bit, and then she only pays a little bit in Social Security and Medicare. So she's still getting a net refund of quite a bit of money. So total amount that came in in her possession, she had the 14,000 in taxable income plus the refund net plus the child support, which is not taxable. So she's actually getting 30,000. Final piece here shows, okay, if she spent 22, how much in sales tax does she pay? So the 6,600 with the rebate at her filing status with the kids, She's going to get back this much, so therefore net, she's paying 2000 compared to having a net refund of 6000 up here. So in this type of situation, it's not necessarily better for the low, low income who get earned income credit. There would have to be some other offset to make this work. With that, we will end this lesson, and we will, I will see you next week for week six in our credits.